Good morning, America. I'm Charles Gibson. And I'm Joan London. Coming up in our first hour on this Friday, March 6th, and now there are four of the Democratic candidates in their last debate before Super Tuesday. We'll have a crash course for you this morning, how to save big money on car insurance. And this is her life, Carrie Fisher's latest roles on screen and off. Spencer. Well, Joan, I'm in Buffalo, New York this morning, and spring-like weather has arrived ahead of schedule here and across the nation. But the bad news is severe storms continue in the southeast, and I'll have details coming up. Charlie? Spencer gets a gold star this morning. It's put right there on his sweater. Right there. I think you'll actually get out on the ice and try it. I understand he is going to try ice skating this afternoon. He has never been on skates before. Should we take bets on if he spends more time on them <laughs> or sitting on the ice? This is not going to be a Christy Yamaguchi performance, I no. can tell you, from Spencer Christie today. But a little later in the program, he's going to be trying that. Uh, also ahead this morning, our consumer editor, Paula Lyons, is going to be back with us. She's been here all week uh, talking about indoor air pollution. She'll wrap up her series today with a visit to really what would be a dream house, a model habitat with its own brain and clean lungs, a contaminant-free house. Sounds good to me. Leading the news, though, at this hour, highlights of last night's debate in Dallas, and Mike Schneider has that story, and the other news of the day. Mike, good morning. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, everyone. You could call it a political event in 3D, a Democratic debate in Dallas. And the four remaining Democratic candidates for the presidential nomination offered their views on everything from the economy to the environment to racial equality. ABC News presented the Super Tuesday debate, and our Mike Von Fremd covered it. In this debate, the candidates were encouraged to ask each other questions and feel free to interrupt. The front runners, Paul Songus and Bill Clinton, mixed it up on the merits of a middle class tax cut. Look, I've been in politics a long time. I would love to have come out for the middle class tax cut. You don't think my advisors beat on me to be for it? To say that this middle class tax cut, number one, is the center of anybody's economic package is wrong. And number two... A lot of people have that impression, I'm sure you know. Yeah, thanks to his ad, which is false, which says that I pay for it by increasing the deficit. <clears throat> and Jerry Brown took Clinton to task over Arkansas's record on civil rights. You've had 11 years to well, get through a civil Jerry, rights act. And you're here trying to appeal Jerry, to African Americans let me tell you and Hispanics, and I want to see where your civil rights Jerry, program is. chill out. Okay. You're from California. Chill out. Cool off the boat. In past debates, the candidates have shied away from talking about foreign policy because it's George Bush's strong suit. But last night, they seemed eager to take him on. Here's the guy who put Manuel Noriega on his payroll, coddled Saddam Hussein, and supported Ferdinand Marcos. Tell me about his foreign policy. Look at Tiananmen Square. He abolished the American standard on human rights by saying to the Chinese, you crushed your students. Well, that's all right. I would eagerly engage him in a foreign policy debate. But before any of them are going to get a chance to do that, they've obviously first got to win the Democratic nomination. And as far as their performance in last night's debate, all the candidates seem to feel they got in their major points, and more important, no one embarrassed themselves. Mike? Super Tuesday coming up very quickly, Mike, and before that, uh, South Carolina primary. Anybody seem to have any sense of momentum at this point? Is Clinton uh, as strong as some people think he might be? Clinton's got the momentum. He's the overwhelming favorite in South uh, Carolina. Tom Harkin is trying very hard there, but the polls are against him. And then going into Super Tuesday, they're really going to be road warriors, 11 states in a very short period of time. The key battleground seems to be Florida, where Paul Songus is moving up. I was going to say, are they going basically as, to as many places as they can? Are the candidates kind of, I guess, uh, looking for areas where they're most likely to get support and kind of concentrating there? Yeah, they're going as many places as they, as they can, but it's pretty tough with 11 states. Uh, they're really going to be hopscotching around. Yeah, Mike, thanks very much. ABC's Mike Von Fremd live for us this morning. There were originally supposed to be five Democrats at last night's debate, but that changed yesterday morning when Nebraska Senator Bob Kerry gave up on his campaign. It is obvious, however, that Kerry still hopes one day to be in the White House, and proof of that could be found in the Bruce Springsteen song that he sang at a rally once he got back to Omaha. The title of the song, by the way, is No Surrender. We made a promise, we swore we'd always remember No retreat, baby, no surrender well, that's Back in Washington now, Democrats pushing through a one and a half trillion dollar budget through the House yesterday. Close vote there, but it did pass. And to try to make a short story out of it, it takes money from the Pentagon and would spend it on domestic programs. House leaders say President Bush's version of the budget is stuck in what they call a Cold War mentality. 
their version deals with what they see as the real threat to the United States. They say that's the recession. Now, the Democratic budget plan exactly was what the candidates were talking about on the Republican campaign trail yesterday. President Bush and Patrick Buchanan crisscrossing the South. Buchanan taking shots at the president. Mr. Bush told a rally what he'll do with the Democratic plan. And you all... If the Democrats in Congress want to send that bill to me, I got a message for them. I will veto it absolutely, positively, overnight. Mr. Bush is in trouble and everybody knows it because he walked away from the mainstream of the Republican Party. He walked away from principles and ideas and policies that were not only right for America, but gave us three straight landslides. Another battle over money has begun in the House of Representatives. This time, the fight is over rubber checks at the House Bank. The House Ethics Committee has voted now to go public with the names of the most chronic check bouncers. But other members of the House are asking, why stop there? Story now from ABC's Cokie Roberts. House members have been dreading this Ethics Committee report. This one's really upset them. And it's upset the House, and it's upset what we do. In the past, you have one poor member, and everyone said, gee, we feel sorry about so-and-so. But now we've got a lot of people that are sitting there saying, oh, gee, is it going to be me? The committee decided it was 19 current members who routinely and repeatedly abused their House banking privileges by overdrawing more than their next month's pay at least eight times in three years. The names of members who bounced six-figure checks a few times would remain secret, along with regular bouncers of smaller amounts. Some junior members object to that decision. This is completely unacceptable. Uh, this line is, is absolutely too high. Uh, what, what we're seeing here is an attempt to protect as many members of Congress as possible. These members will fight on the House floor next week to reveal the names of the more than 350 members who ever bounced any check. Are we going to police ourselves, or, Mr. Speaker, are the people of this country going to believe that we covered this matter up? The anti-incumbent mood has Congress terrified already, and the bank scandals just got members scared more. So rather than face charges of a cover-up, members are likely to let the public know who bounced the checks. Cokie Roberts, ABC News, Capitol Hill. Finally, there was a dramatic rescue in Arizona on Mount Graham after the crash of a medical helicopter, a crash that killed two people. Take a look at these amazing pictures now. You're going to see a doctor with very steady nerves dangling from a hovering rescue helicopter and a paramedic grabbing an injured paramedic off the mountain there, the one who was hurt in the original crash of the first helicopter. The doctor and the victim then, as you can see, held onto a harness together while the rescue helicopter took them about a mile away, eventually to a safe landing. That is the news till now. It's time to check in with Joan. All right, Mike, thank you very much. It's seven minutes after seven right now. And Spencer Christian this morning is in Buffalo, New York with the National Weather Forecast. Spencer, good morning. Good morning, Joan. And just in case you're wondering where I am in Buffalo, I'm in Buffalo's Memorial Auditorium. And that, of course, is the skating rink, the ice, where tomorrow a big annual extravaganza called Under the Big Top will be going on. I'll be the ringmaster as hundreds of kids with uh, various disabilities and handicaps perform on the ice. And that's going to be quite a show. We'll be telling you more about that and talking to some of the participants later in this program. But right now, let's participate in a look at today's weather. It's going to be a very, very stormy day out west again today. This is a satellite view of the storm system pushing onshore late yesterday and overnight uh, into California and the rest of the west coast. It brought heavy rainfall, heavy snow in the higher elevations of the mountains in the interior regions of California and Nevada, and two to four inches of rainfall along coastal northern and central California. So maybe this storm will bring some drought relief, but it certainly has brought some unpleasant weather. In the bigger picture, we see that the stormy weather will continue in the southwest today as that storm system drops into southern California, southern uh, Nevada, and down into Arizona. It'll be sunny in the eastern portion of the Rockies and down into the southern plains as Texas starts to dry out a bit after heavy rainfall there over the last couple of days. But rain will reach from the southeast up to the mid-Atlantic and then wrap up through the Great Lakes and the upper Mississippi Valley and into the northern plains. Sort of a dreary day there. High temperatures, though, remain on the mild side for just about the entire country. Highs generally in the 50s and 60s through the central part of the nation, 70s and 80s down south, approaching the 90-degree mark, and we still have 14 days left in winter. That's a look at the national weather picture. Here's a look at the weather where you are. Good Friday morning, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Rexroth. Today will be mostly cloudy with another chance of some thunder showers. It will be mild, though, with another high of 61 degrees. Winds will be from the southeast at 5 to 15 miles per hour.
And I'll have more on today's weather and more on the big skating extravaganza coming up in the next half hour. Charlie? Thanks, Spencer. Coming up now in 10 minutes after the hour, as you heard in the news, the remaining four Democratic presidential candidates met last night in Dallas in a debate televised nationally by ABC, the last joint forum for the candidates before Super Tuesday. And in last night's debate, there were times when the campaign rhetoric was upstaged by dramatic moments. And you're here trying to appeal Jerry, to African Americans let me tell you and Hispanics, and I want to see where your civil rights Jerry, program is. Chill out. Okay. You're from California. Chill out. Cool out. As from Washington, joining us from Washington this morning is ABC News correspondent Koki Roberts. She has been covering the campaign since its outset and has acted as moderator for one of the earlier debates. And also with us is E.J. Dion Jr., political columnist for the Washington Post and author of the book Why Americans hate politics and good to see you both again thanks for being with us EJ let me start with you that was an interesting clip because it is obvious on Super Tuesday that the black vote is going to be very critical in many states and Bill Clinton has shown very great strength among black voters and he's now under attack were points scored points scored against him last night I think when you look at this debate after it, it's going to run under the headline, The Big Chill. That line is going to be used so often for the next week. Uh, I think, in fact, he probably got the better of the exchange, especially uh, the later exchange on the same subject when Jerry Brown presented him with a picture of uh, a group of people who were in a prison boot camp. And Clinton kind of managed to convey what he's trying to convey to both uh, a black audience and to a kind of downscale white audience, which is, I'm compassionate, yes, and I'm tough. Yes. And so I think everybody knows that if Clinton loses that stronghold on the black vote that he had in Georgia and in Maryland last week, uh, he's going to be a much weaker candidate. But I don't think they managed to weaken that hold last night. And he doesn't really have a competitor in that field. Uh, there's no one of the other three candidates who is likely to gain the black vote. And of course, the important thing is that Clinton is the first candidate we've seen in a very long time who got both the black vote and a majority of the white vote. In, uh, in a southern primary, so that that is a very strong position for him to be in. I must tell you, though, Charlie, E.J. and I watched this debate together with our respective spouses, and on that uh, chill, chill out uh, comment, the guys liked it, the girls didn't. Well, and obviously, the, guys, <laughs> the, well, the, women, the women thought he was tough. The, women thought no, the men was thought rude. he was tough, rather, and the women thought he was rude. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, E.J., I interrupted you. you no, I was saying? just saying clearly the men choose the sound bites because that's the one we're seeing. <laughs> <laughs> Probably true. Koki, it's interesting. We tend in the media to emphasize tone, whether there is, are gaffes in debates or whatever, but there really is, has been over the weeks in these debates, genuine economic debate among the candidates, real differences delineated. Do you think people see it and do you think it's having an effect? Well, it, it seems to be because the voters are going along the lines of what the candidates are saying. Now, we, we simplify it and so do they, uh, much more than we do in their ads and in their attacks. But uh, Paul Sangas' uh, main message is a, a pro-business, as he says, message. And what is he getting? He's getting the votes of people who make over $75,000 a year and have post-graduate educations. Uh, Bill Clinton is saying that he's aim aiming more at retraining and at the workers and human capital. And he's getting the votes of people who make uh, under $15,000 a year and have less than a high school education. And then they they divide them up in between. So there is something beyond just image getting out there. There is some sort of message clearly getting to the voters. And EJ, you'd agree with that, that the, that the economic debate really is beginning to, uh, to have an effect on uh, voters and how they make their decisions? I think it is, and I think to extend Kogi's analogy, if you look at Jerry Brown, the votes he's been getting tend to come from youngish people or from the kind, if you will, people in the 60s generation, people 30 to 44. Uh, and that his message is penetrating with the people who ought to be, in theory, voting for him. Um, I think the, the economic debate is, in a way, both sort of obvious to people and they get it, but it's also getting a little bit complicated. I think the problem with a debate 
like you had last night or any of the debates, is that people tend to focus in more and more narrowly on so issues like which tax cut are you going to be for? At a certain point in the mm. debate, you wanted them to stop. Please don't give us another specific tax cut. <laughs> and I think that's when they start losing people. When they pick people back up again is when they go to the broader themes. I think those are beginning to penetrate. But part of the problem is, is there been enough debate so that they've all heard each other so many times right. that they can recite each other's speeches, and so can we. And they, uh, and so that they now try to make different speeches, and that does get more detailed and specific. And I also think they are so accustomed to listening to each other that they kind of forget that a lot of the audience just walked in on this right. show and well, never saw what the guy had said two debates ago. That's what I was going to ask you, AJ. There's, you know, there's talk always among the candidates, America at a turning point, this is a critical election. I mean, never has it been so important, uh, you know, to the country, etc. But I wonder if the country's engaged, really, in this debate, the turnouts being so low so far in the primaries. Is the country really into this yet? I think the country wants to be in it. I think if you looked at the early part, especially of the New Hampshire primary, when there was a lot of focus, and when the voters themselves were getting an awful lot of information uh, from their local news as well as the national news and all the ads, yeah. uh, they really cared about this debate, and they sensed that it is a turning point in the country. I think at this phase of the campaign, the campaign is so scattered across the country, no candidate has the resources to penetrate anywhere, and I think that's why you're mm. seeing a certain frustration with the debate. The one thing that penetrates are attacks, uh, and you're going to see more of those. I think that for a while is going to turn the electorate off. I think the good news is that when the debate uh, and when the campaign is concentrated in a few states again, you're going to see a little more focus. In Colorado, for instance, Good. which had its first primary, did uh, have a high turnout. So people were, for the first time, saying, hey, we've got a primary. Let's go vote. Yes, they did, they did have about a 50% <laughs> turnout in Colorado. Koki, thanks very much. E.J. Dion, thank you for being thank with you. us. Good to see you both again. 16 after the hour, saving on car insurance. It's no accident, and our money editor, Tyler Matheson, will tell you how, and Good Morning America continues. Stay with us. I believe that the man who wears a suit at work or needs one for a special occasion deserves a great suit affordably priced. That's why each form